Welcome to what promises to be a, a really enlightening conversation with my old friend and colleague, Mark Whitaker, who is the author of Saying It Loud, 1966, the year Black Power challenged the civil rights movement. This book was just published uh, last week. Uh, I've read it. It is extraordinarily good. It is extraordinarily timely and an important work of history. So um, we welcome uh, any uh, questions that those of you uh, in the National Archives or YouTube audience might have. Um, when, I, uh, when you pose the questions at a certain point after that, maybe not right away, I will pose them to Mark. Uh, Mark is a former uh, editor of Newsweek. He was the first African-American to head a major uh, national news organization, uh, former um, senior vice president at CNN, um, and he's held various other titles over the years, Washington bureau chief for NBC News. I won't go through his entire resume, um, but he's the author of uh, several other books, um, which I also recommend to you. Uh, and this one, um, uh, I think, guarantees Mark's place uh, as an important American historian. Um, so uh, let's just jump right in. Um, Mark, welcome. And I want to ask you uh, off at the top, the civil rights movement really extended over a period of decades, but you have focused just on one year in the movement. Why? Well, first of all, thank, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, you know, the for 10 years before 1966, really, there is a, a pretty consistent through line in um, the uh, objectives of the civil rights movement, the tactics of the civil rights movement, and the leadership of the civil rights movement, starting with the Montgomery bus boycott in, 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 in 1955, 1956, then going through the sit-in uh, uh, movement, um, uh, the Freedom Rides, the Birmingham campaign, all the way to the, uh, the Selma march uh, in, in 1965, um, the, the focus is on passing legislation uh, to address the problems of, of discrimination and voter suppression. Uh, the tactics are um, nonviolent protest, even in the, in the face of, 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 of you know, violent uh, policing and so forth. Uh, and and the, 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 the leader um, uh, recognized within the movement and in the media and around the world is, is, is Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in 1966, um, all of a sudden things change, um, largely as the result of the, um, the restlessness of a young black generation um, that uh, questioned both the objectives and the tactics. So um, they, uh, and a lot of them had their experience. Uh, there was a, a part of this generation um, that I write about um, who had formed this organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, um, which had gone into the deep South to organize uh, uh, blacks to vote in places where they hadn't been allowed to vote um, in generations. Uh, and that were incredibly violent, that were, you know, uh, uh, the Ku Klux Klan operated with impunity. The, the police themselves were, were, were racist and had sheriff deputies who terrorized uh, black community. Um, and you had uh, a young generation in the North that had with their families uh, come from the South uh, over the previous um, 40 years, 50 years or so, um, and had grown up in these Northern communities that particularly after World War II had become increasingly predominantly black and run down once white people moved to the suburbs and urban renewal 
uh, had really a terrible effect on the economics of those community and where policing became started to feel like more and more of a of an of a sort of an occupation like um, um, rather than sort of a community policing model. Um, so their experience had been very different. And as a result of their experience, they were posing all kinds of questions. One was, do we, can we, in the face of everything that we confront, that we've seen in the Deep South and that we've seen in these Northern communities, can we um, uh, declare that we are going to be unconditionally nonviolent. So they wanted to at least reserve, they weren't initially talking about uh, violent provocation or confrontation, but they were saying that they felt that they had at least the right to defend themselves. So um, they also were questioning the, the, the goal of integration, you know, um, you know the, the, the vision that, that Dr. King laid out in, in the March on Washington when he talked about, you know, uh, his dream um, of, of, of a sort of peaceful integrated society. Well, what the young generation was saying is based on our experience, what we've seen is that actually white people aren't interested in, they may, you know, there may be some liberal whites who would be willing to integrate and live side by side with well-educated um, uh, middle-class blacks, but most white people have no interest in, in integrating with sharecroppers uh, no, most have no, no interest in integrating with, you know, folks who, you know, live in, 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 in these inner city uh, neighborhoods in the north. Um, so, um, you know, they were raising questions about that. So eventually, in the middle of all of this, this whole spirit of, of, of questioning and restlessness galvanizes around the slogan of Black Power. And we can talk about how that happened. Yeah, but really... It, but so, but but really, what it is is like a for the for after ten years, it is a dramatic shift in the tone of the debate, and there is, as I say in the in the in the subtitle of the book, a challenge to the sort of orthodoxy of the civil rights movement that that had prevailed for a decade. So Malcolm X had been assassinated the year before in 1965, so he kind of began that challenge although it was tinged with, you know, the politics of the Nation of Islam and, and a whole kind of sideshow involving that. But then in 1966, um, SNCC kind of uh, goes through a very tumultuous period. And so if you could kind of take us through what happened with John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael and where all of that came from and went uh, in the course of just a year. So SNCC was an organization that had been formed. It really sort of came out of the sit-in movement, the lunch counter sit-in movement, um, which was started and led by, by, by young people. Um, uh, the uh, Ella Baker, um, a, a really fascinating and historic figure who I think is you know, known, but perhaps not well known enough, who had been a veteran, she had worked for the NACP, she had worked for, for King's organization, the SCLC, but she organized a retreat for, for, these, for these young people. And, um, uh, and, um, um, and uh, uh, encouraged them to form their own organization. And that became SNCC and their focus um, was uh, going into the Deep South, actually to places that even the SCLC wouldn't go, uh, and partnering with local activists on the ground to register uh, predominantly poor uh, Blacks uh, to vote. Um, and the uh, leader going into 1966, the chairman of SNCC was John Lewis, of course, who you know we now remember as you know the congressman and sort of sainted uh, figure uh, that he became. Um, he had he had been active in the early one uh, one uh, sit in uh, movement. Um, he uh, had uh, become first famous for giving a speech. Uh, along with Dr. King at the March on Washington. And then in 1965, he famously 
um, uh, gets beaten um, bloody on the Edmund Pettus Bridge at the beginning of the of the Selma March, and he sort of at that point becomes nationally known, um, sort of famous, and um, the uh, so for the for the year between Selma. So in 1966, you know, uh, uh, SNCC would have these period, every year they would have a retreat where they would rent some place where they could all gather and talk about their strategy and for, you know, what was, uh, they had planned for the coming year. And and then at the end of the retreat, they would have an election to elect um, uh, their officers for the coming year. And... Um, and so the the in in the in the spring of 19, uh, 1966 they held a retreat at a place called Kingston Springs near Nashville um and uh Lewis arrives at I have a whole chapter in the book just about this retreat um and uh and this election Lewis had been traveling uh in Europe raising money and giving speeches for SNCC he arrives at the retreat badly jet lagged completely exhausted um, but but expecting that he's going to be easily reelected, um, uh, and at this vote on the last night, he actually is. They have a, they have a vote, and he wins easily. But there there had been while he was going around giving speeches and raising money, there had been a, sort of a growing discontent in the ranks with with his leadership. Why that people the more militant factions within SNCC thought that he was too close to Dr. King, that he was too eager to um, uh, uh, work with President Johnson, who they were very suspicious of, um, and that he just was distracted with all this travel and so forth. Um, and so a lot on the first vote, even though he won handily, um, a significant number of SNCC members abstained. And so after that vote, one of the more militant members basically challenged the results of the first vote on the basis of not a, that not enough people had voted. So this unleashes this wild debate um, that goes on through the night to the crack of dawn and then finally gets increasingly acrimonious. People start calling John Lewis names. He gets quite defensive about the whole thing. And then eventually at, at, you know, literally at the crack of dawn, you know, you can, it's almost like a movie. You can see it in the book. Um, they hold a second vote and he's defeated and Stokely Carmichael is elected the chairman. Um, this, it crushes John Lewis. John Lewis, his whole identity had been tied up with SNCC. He did not see it coming. Um, he accepted the results of the vote and soldiered on for a couple of months before he resigned from SNCC. But it really took him several decades, almost two decades to recover from it. Um, he was really lost at that point. And, and even when he, you know, later, you know, ran for Congress and, you know, sort of became what we remember him as, he was still quite bitter about it. And in his own memoirs, you know, um, uh, it, was, it, it, it just leaps off the page how hurt he was by that experience. So um, set the stage a little bit for Stokely Carmichael, who was working quite successfully um, on voter registration, uh, particularly in the period right after um, Voting Rights Act was enacted, which was the year before. But um, tell people um, about a little something briefly about Loudoun's County, Alabama. Um, how many African-Americans lived there and how many were allowed to vote before the civil rights, before the Voting Rights Act, just to give people some sense of what the, the challenge was. Or if you don't remember so, so exactly- Stokely Carmichael was this there. very, you know, charismatic, um, smart, handsome, um, organizer who had, um, he was born in the Caribbean, but then he spent his formative years in New York. He went to Howard University. He sort of joined the activist movement and then SNCC while he was at Howard. Um, and um, the in the year leading up to 1966 and into 1966, he was the field secretary for SNCC in Lowndes County, Alabama, which was um, one of these places in the Deep South 
where where blacks were in an overwhelming majority in terms of the population, but had been not a single black had been allowed to vote or had been able to register to vote in 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 60 years. Um, and Stokely, um, Stokely's view on the whole on voter registration was that uh, it only even after the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that in uh, places like Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth, um, he the question was like his question was uh, how far does the, the the right to vote get us when the only people the only candidates we have to vote for are uh, are, are 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 you know white supremacist Democrats you know these states at the time were controlled by the Democratic Party they were openly white supremacists um, you know uh, we all know about. George Wallace, who was the uh, the governor of Alabama uh, at the time, the the slogan of the Democratic Party in Alabama literally was was white supremacy for the right. Um, so he basically encouraged uh, what he tried to do as a sort of an experiment in Lowndes County was not only to register a critical mass of voters, but then to get them to form their own uh, independent black political party. And, you know, he he under he found this kind of obscure Alabama law that laid out the procedure for how to do that. And miraculously, in the course of one year, um, he or he not only registered, uh, you know, uh, enough uh, blacks in Lowndes County to make that happen, but they actually held the nominating com convention. They nominated their own candidates uh, to run for, for local offices like sheriff and for the school board and so forth and so on. And that, that had all been the nominating convention. And again, it's a, a pretty dramatic scene in the book happens just before this, uh, this, this, uh, retreat, um, in, in Kingston Springs when he becomes the chairman. And so when he starts talking in the middle of the summer, and we'll get to that about black power, that's that was what he was talking about at first. It was black political power. I mean, the press started very quickly assuming that it was all about um, rejecting nonviolence. And, and, and there was a part of it that became that increasingly. But at the beginning, when he talked about black power, what he was talking about is blacks have to use their newfound voting power to elect their own candidates. And what was which, the, you know, what was the obviously logo, was not a crazy idea. What, what was the logo, the the mascot, or, uh, logo is probably a better word, for that party that was then picked up by some folks in Oakland, California? Yeah, so uh, again, under these this local law in Alabama, that, you know, the, the, the requirements for starting a, your, a, a new party um, parties were uh, required to have symbols, which traditionally had been animals. Uh, why? Because there were so many people in those areas, black and white, who couldn't read. So it was a way for, you know, people who were illiterate or semi-illiterate to identify which party they were voting for when so they was it vote. donkey and elephant for the Democrats and Republicans? So, so well, actually, so so that's where the elephant and the donkey come from. Um, um, but in Alabama, actually, the Democratic Party, the, the donkey wasn't good enough for them. So they they had adopted a rooster. <laughs> so they're they're the the George Wallace Democrat. Their their symbol was a rooster, and then their slogan was white supremacy for the right. Anyway, so so once. Um, Stokely had organized this new black political party. The, the, the symbol they chose was a black panther. Um, and so, you know, we all know the name, the, you know, the black panther, the black panther party, but we associate it with the Huey Newton and Bobby Seale and the black panthers who started out in the West Coast. But actually the first black panther party was in Lowndes County, Alabama. And um, and what happened was that later in 1966, in the fall, Stokely was invited to give a speech at the University of California at Berkeley. And in advance of that speech, sort of to you know publicize the speech, uh, they uh, 
a lot of these pamphlets um, uh, uh, that you know had been created for the for the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, the Black Panther Party campaigns in in Alabama were brought to Oakland and started to circulate there. And Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, whose names probably most people listening now have heard of, um, at the time they were uh, a part-time community college students and in Oakland, California, and who had been involved in activism uh, at that school, but were disenchanted with the leaders, uh, the campus leaders at the time. They were looking to form their own organization. And when they saw this Panther logo on these pamphlets that were circulating around the Bay Area, they said, hey, that looks pretty cool. We'll just take it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll appropriate uh, the symbol. And they did. And so the, the the Black Panther Party that is that became associated with the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, started by uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, was exactly the same Black Panther, exactly the same Black Panther that originally had been adopted in Alabama. And they used California open carry laws, which are very familiar now in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, to their advantage, how did that work? So, so, uh, so the in forming their own political party, um, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, uh, they wrote what is still, you know, very well known um, a, a, a a document called the Ten Point Program. Um, so um, that was sort of their blueprint for what they wanted were 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 going to try to accomplish. Now, in fact, if you go and read the, and the, the whole 10 point program is in my book. And it's, it's really interesting in retrospect because they raise some objectives that are still very much in discussion like reparations and, and, and so forth. But the thing that they were really, a lot, you know, a lot of it was unrealistic then and, and now. But the thing, the practical thing that they really plan to do um, uh, and uh, immediately was to uh, create uh, civilian patrols to monitor police behavior in Oakland. Now, this was also was not a new idea. Um, in, in LA, uh, after the Watts riots of 1965, uh, some local black leaders had created a civilian patrol that had been going around. And what they would do was they wouldn't confront the police but they would ride around town and look for situations where police were interacting with, with black folks in the community. And then they would get, you know, they would get out of their cars and they would just sort of stand at a remove across the street or whatever, close enough so that the police could see them, just to sort of say to them, you know, look, we're here. So, you know, if if you know anything that goes down here between you and these people who you're, you know, questioning or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, will be witnesses. And again, when you think about today, um, you know, all of these horrific incidents of police violence that we've been, um, you know, confronted with uh, in, in recent years that have led to the Black Lives Matter movement, why do we know about them? We know about them because of cell phones. We know about them because of police body cam. Well, you know, that didn't exist at the time. So essentially, these were kind of like human witnesses. That was the idea. But Huey Newton, who was this interesting, largely self-taught guy who had struggled with learning disability problems early in his youth, but had taught himself to read and become a big reader, he uh, discovered he would he would go into law libraries, you know, at, at public publicly uh, open li law libraries, and, and read through California law books, looking for things that you know he could be used to 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 the advantage of of of, of activists like him. And he discovered that uh, at the time, California had open carry gun laws, which meant that it was legal, it was perfectly legal, not only to possess, but to carry guns with you in public as long as they were visible. Um, and so his idea was, we're gonna take this, these community patrol, police patrol uh, idea one step further uh, by arming ourselves. So when we show up and stand across the street and, and are you know observing the cops, they'll see that we, we are armed at the same time. They'll take us more seriously. 
Um, so California. And so, that, and so that that was again, you know, that was the original idea of the Black Panther Party for Self Defense, which which again today, given everything we're still living with, is not at all a crazy idea. And and California, of course, immediately changed its law to prohibit uh, cons- uh, open carry. Yes, as soon as as soon as young black men were 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 going around uh, openly uh, carrying guns, um, a Republican uh, state lawmaker named Don Mulford uh, introduced an act to to make that illegal, and it was it, it didn't it literally it'd be interesting just to see, it'd months. be interesting to see whether in the next couple of years, um, with a bunch of states now having open carry, whether you'll see young Black activists, um, you know, carrying weapons in public again. Yeah, well, you know, look, I mean, but it, it, you know, it's it's really interesting. So, so as the Mulford Act was being uh, debated uh, in early 1967, uh, a a group of Panthers uh, went to Sacramento, uh, to the state capitol. Uh, with their guns, but in their uniforms, you know, the, the, Huey Newton and, and Bobby Seale had one, one of the, 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 of course, everybody remembers them for their berets and their leather jackets as well. They had this sort of cool uniform. And so they show up um, and they, um, and they're, you know, they're photographed, they're, the pictures of, of, of them uh, 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 appearing in, in Sacramento, you know, are in the front pages of newspapers around the country, their TV reports. Now, of course, this horrifies a lot of people in, you know, in white America uh, and in the media, but it made them incredibly attractive <laughs> to, to young blacks around the country. So without actually having to formally create new chapters of the Black Panther Party, Black Panther parties, you know, uh, 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 local chapters started to spontaneously form uh, with people in places like Chicago, where you grew up, and you know elsewhere around the country, just adopting their uniform and the name Black Panthers uh, without and their that actually was the same having year to. When they requested that the media not call Black people Negroes anymore, um, you saw the beginning of dashikis, all kinds of other things. So, talk just for a minute about the cultural changes that were taking root that year. Right. So 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 in addition to all the sort of political the shift in the political debate um, that we've been talking about, 1966 is also the year where um, uh, there is this uh, sort of uh, outpouring um, and embrace of what the, was co- they called black consciousness. So uh, and it ran the gamut from how black people wanted to be identified so it was a year when in significant numbers, particularly young blacks said, we don't want to be called Negroes anymore. We want to be called black. It was the year when the Afro hairstyle um, took off and, and black folks says, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're not going to straighten our hair to look like white hair anymore. And um, Ebony Magazine, which was sort of, you know, the, the uh, sort of uh, ratified that by uh, by putting there was a cover called The Natural Look. They did a whole cover story just on Afros. Um, Daishikis became a fashion statement, the African tunics. Um, it was also the year, in, in at the end of the year, when the first black, first Kwanzaa was celebrated. And a, a cultural nationalist named Ron Karenga, based in Los Angeles, formed an entire, his own movement um, uh, called Us, U.S., that was really focused on cultural nationalism even more than the sort of political dimension. Now, black. the women's movement was, uh, you know, in full flower at that point, but there were always tensions inside these other movements, the anti-war movement, civil rights movement, involving women. Uh, you mentioned Ella Baker, um, Talk a little bit about um, both a uh, a long forgotten figure in SNCC and also about the role of women in some of the better things that the Panthers did, like these, you know, school lunch program type activities. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so, um, uh, so the, 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 the sadly largely unknown figure um, or not well enough known figure who you're alluding to, it was named uh, Ruby Doris Smith Robinson. Her maiden name was Smith, family name. And then she married uh, uh, a fellow named Robinson and took his name. Um, it, and um, she was, she grew up in Atlanta. Um, she went to Spelman College. She became involved with, with SNCC uh, by essentially tailing at, around after her older sister, who had been one of the early uh, uh, sit-in uh, leaders. And, 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 um, and uh, she uh, works, goes to work in the, uh, at SNCC headquarters in Atlanta and very quickly becomes the, the more than really an assistant, sort of the top aide to the then executive secretary of SNCC, uh, the number two position uh, named Jim Foreman. Uh, and Jim Foreman was the guy who really organized SNCC as, 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 a, as a functioning um, uh, organization, created a budget, um, uh, did fundraising, uh, hi did the hiring. Um, and Ruby Doris really, you know, sort of was 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 key to all of that. She she he gave her, you know, a lot of responsibility. She was really as as much as he was running the the, the entire organization uh, on a day to day basis um, and was incredibly. She was tough as nails. Everybody who talks about her, you know, very blunt, very efficient, just did not suffer um, uh, any kind of foolishness. Um, and so in 1966, Jim Foreman had been doing the job for, for, you know, almost since the beginning of SNCC. Um, he was, he, he, he uh, he was burned out. He was suffering from ulcers. So he announces that he's going to step down and everybody within the organization agrees that Ruby Doris should replace him. So at this same retreat um, in in uh, at Kingston Springs, where where Stokely Carmichael is elected chairman, she's elected as executive secretary. At this point, she's still in her you know twenty five years old. She is the uh, highest ranking woman in the entire civil rights movement, um, and um, uh, and and at first she. Uh, as Stokely really sort of starts to sort of take SNCC in a more sort of openly militant direction, she supports him. But then, you know, once he really, you know, became a celebrity and was being covered in the media and invited to speak all over the country um, uh, and getting more and more outrageous um, uh, in, in, in his rhetoric, um, she saw the effect it was having uh, on fundraising, on morale among the organizers in the field. And by the, by the fall, when uh, the, SNCC, the new SNCC leadership has their own sort of mini retreat just for the, for the, for the, for the officers, uh, she writes a memo, a very tough memo that circulates basically talking about the damage that Stokely is doing uh, his his uh, uh, a lot of you know his his appearances as doing to the organization, um, and forces him to confront this criticism at the retreat. Um, so um, she, you know, what's and then but, but tragically, uh, she uh, at the very beginning of 1967 she fell ill. At first, it was a mystery why she was so sick. Ultimately, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and she died in 1967 at the age of, of 26, you know, leaving behind her husband and a two-year-old child. Um, and, you know, it's very sad at, on a human level, but it's also, you know, once you really understand what she had to offer and how respected she was and how tough she was, it's hard to, you know, resist the feeling that, you know, had she lived, perhaps some of the things that happened very quickly to sort of, you know, make SNCC unravel uh, and, you know, might not have happened and, th and that she might have gone on to, be, you know, be a much more important figure uh, in, uh, in, in the Black Power Movement and, and indeed in the entire civil rights um, 
entire civil rights. In movement. the meantime, part of that unraveling was expelling white people from SNCC, right? Yes. So 1966, you know, again, you asked why 1966. Well, you know, I, you know, I didn't really, you know, and I, it was only in the course of, of really starting to do the research and the reporting. My original idea was I was going to do a narrative history of black power. But I, I I spent my first year just reporting and 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 doing research, and I was still in 1966. And I realized that like so much happened just in that one year that there was a book just in that. And so another thing that happened in 1966 it was the year that, and again, it was a story that unfolded over the year. It didn't happen all at once. Um, and I sort of you know um, that becomes clear in the book. But it ended with the expulsion of the last white members of SNCC. And SNCC had always been, it was always from the beginning, it was created by young uh, black activists. It was always, the, the top leadership was always black. But in the early days of SNCC, they welcomed white volunteers. And there were these white volunteers who joined some of them in the field, went to jail, you know, you know, paid the dues that, that a lot of the Black organizers did, and and even more who who you know worked in the in in the Atlanta headquarters, uh, and who considered themselves you know just as loyal to SNCC as as the black members, but there was this this faction within SNCC that beginning in early 1966 started to argue that it was you know blacks had to sort of as a manifestation of this of this new spirit. Of, of, of black consciousness and black pride and black and black power that blacks had to run the organization and it really needed to be an all black organization. And at first, th both the previous leadership, John Lewis and, and Jim Foreman, and then even er in the early days, Stokely Carmichael kind of rebuffed uh, th this faction. Um, but by the end of the year, they, they prevailed in another wild scene at an, at another retreat at the end of the year uh, at, a, at a black Catskill resort owned by a one-legged tap dancer named um, named Pigleg Bates. Um, and in another one of these late night votes um, with lots of people abstaining, they, they voted to expel the last white members. And, and, and I, I talked to one of them uh, who was a, a fascinating woman, uh, Dorothy uh, Dottie uh, Miller Zellner, um, and and I talked to to a number, of, you know, quite a few other people who had been either uh, officially in SNCC or sympathetic to SNCC, um, uh, white members and supporters uh, who are still alive, and and you know, John, they're still incredibly bitter uh, about it. You know, I mean, when you look at the historical significance of that development. Um, and you think about the backlash against civil rights um, at the polls in 1966, which turned out to be a big Republican year just after Johnson's landslide in 1964. And that then shaded over into Nixon's law and order movement, his own code words, his Southern strategy uh, before and after he was elected in 1968, if SNCC had not turned anti-white and if it had been truer to the nonviolent part of the coordinating committee, um, could things have gone differently politically in the United States? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to know for sure, but, um, you know, again, you know, what, what really, the, the the other thing that happened in 1966 and and which makes 1966 you know really an important year not just in 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 the history of the civil rights movement uh but in in as a turning point in american politics is as you say um in 1964 lyndon johnson had had beat uh uh, uh goldwater barry goldwater in a, in a historic landslide. The Democrats had had uh, uh, veto proof majorities in the Senate and the House, you know, completely dominant control. And you go back and you look at the punditry in 1964 and, you know, 
political columnists and reporters were saying that the Republican Party, it would take a generation for the Republican Party to recover. Well, it only took two years because um, uh, in 1966, largely based on what you know was called a white backlash against a number of things. So it was partly this new slogan of Black, of black Power and Stokely Carmichael. Um, uh, you had white candidates campaigning, making Stokely Carmichael himself sort of the focus of their campaign. Um, vote for me because, you know, I'm against Stokely Carmichael. Um, uh, but also it was the third summer of racial unrest in America's cities that it started in Harlem in 1964 and Watts in 1965. In 1966, there are um, sort of uh, they were called riots, but, you know, now some people think of them as rebellions um, that uh, in places, uh, there was one in Chicago, in Atlanta, in Omaha that year, uh, and in uh, and in San Francisco at a place called in a neighborhood called Hunter's Point. Um, so so some of this change in uh, the, the sort of political mood. Uh, it, it was driven by all of that, but it's but it's very stark because um, Newsweek magazine, where both of us worked for for many years, was known in those days for its civil rights coverage, and for commissioning the then editor of Newsweek, Osborne Elliott, uh, was friendly with Lewis Harris, the sort of up and coming pollster who had worked for 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 John F. Kennedy, um, and he commissioned three huge polls in the course of the 60s in 1963, 1966, and 1969. And Harris, where Harris would uh, had separate teams of white and black pollsters who would go out and the black team would talk to, 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 to black folks and the white team would talk to white folks. And they the first poll that they did in 1963 had actually shown signs of progress, hopeful signs in terms of increasing support for civil rights and respect for Dr. King. In 1966, uh, Oz Elliott commissions another poll and it shows like this dramatic, and it's just it's just a couple months after the black power cry becomes, you know, everybody starts talking about that. Um, and all of a sudden you see just the, you know, uh, support for the entire civil rights project. Um, um, starts to fall apart oh, in um, uh, ask whether blacks should be protesting even nonviolently. Uh, the the white folks in the poll say, over by more than two to one say blacks shouldn't even be protesting nonviolently. So um, and then so that was kind of the sign of how the mood had shifted. And then by the fall, you see it reflected in the results of the of the midterm elections when uh, Ronald Reagan was elected governor of California the first time. And the whole last month of the campaign is a debate about whether Stokely Carmichael should be allowed to come and speak at, at, at Berkeley, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, uh, the Republicans uh, capture all these other state houses. They pick up um, a lot of seats in, in the House. Uh, even on the Democratic side, the Democratic Party becomes even more white supremacist. Um, uh, uh, Lester Maddox, who was an out and out supremacist, is elected the governor of Georgia. Uh, George Wallace, who was term limited under Alabama law, convinced his wife, Lurleen, who was a total political novice, to run in his stead. And she wins in a bigger landslide than he had ever won. And the, the publicity around that campaign positions him to run for president in 1968. And Richard Nixon sees all of this and realizes that, um, you know, he he might have another comeback opportunity. And it's really in 1966 that you can see that he starts thinking about running for president. And when he does, two years later, in 1968, as you say, his whole campaign is about, about law and order, which is sort of a, you know, a, a, a dog whistle way of talking about race. So I, I want to turn the conversation to Martin Luther King. Um, I have a, a personal connection to him because I met him when I was eight years old in 1966. Uh, he was he had moved to a slum on the west side of Chicago to draw attention to problems of poverty and race in the north. And 
he was raising money for a, a big rally at Soldier Field. And my parents, who were what were called lakefront liberals in Chicago, had a, a party for him um, in his honor. And I, you know, was allowed to stay up late for the party. I got his autograph. It was many years before I understood what was uh, going on that year. And I later for Newsweek, 30 years later, I went to the site of the apartment house, which had been torn down where he and Coretta Scott King had, had lived. But what was that all about? What, what was Martin Luther King doing in the North and how did it end? So I have two chapters in the in the book about 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 that. Um, so in 1966, Dr. King decides that he wants to uh, take the civil rights movement to the north, and also um, to broaden the the focus to uh, uh, other issues, specifically, most importantly, housing. Um, so he chooses Chicago because there's already. Um, a, a group, a very well-run, organized group of, of activists, black activist group already on the ground in Chicago. Um, he partners with them um, and uh, announces that he's going to start this campaign in, in Chicago, that the focus is going to be on, it was initially on housing conditions in rental conditions for, for renters, uh, on the west side of Chicago. It later in the second phase uh, becomes about um, opportunities to buy housing for blacks in white neighborhoods uh, in the city. Um, and um, he decides that to show how serious he is about this, that he's going to rent an apartment and have his family live part time in Chicago. Now, it turns out that this is largely for show. They do rent an apartment and they spend a, a few nights there, but you know they never really move there. Um, uh, but uh, it ends. It very quickly becomes uh, clear that the conditions in Chicago are very, very different, even than the conditions that he confronted in in the South. Um, uh, and uh, first of all, he had to contend with Mayor Daley. Um, uh, who, um, you know, didn't really appreciate King showing up in Chicago and, and making, in his view, him look bad by talking about, you know, these terrible conditions for black folks uh, in the city. Um, so there's this, you know, it, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's not exactly funny, but there's this really sort of interesting interplay between the two of them where, um, uh, you know, they keep after every time they meet, they hold a press conference and, you know, they're sort of taking digs at each other. Um, but um, uh, so Daly is sort of trying to, you know, uh, go through the motions of looking like he's 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 working with Dr. King and cooperating, but then also sort of resisting uh, at the same time. And then particularly in the second phase, when King uh, uh, starts focusing on, uh, on, on fair housing um, and uh, picketing and holding marches in these white neighborhoods uh, where blacks have been denied the right to even look at houses, uh, let alone buy them. Um, he's met with just this ferociously violent counter protest. You know, thousands of, 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 of white, you know, uh, Chicagoans showing up in the street, hurling rocks, and then he, get, he, he himself gets hit in the head with a rock. Uh, he, he, he um, you know, you can go on YouTube and, and see some of, some of this footage uh, of, of all of that. And, at, you know, he described it as as bad, if not worse, than, 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 mo than things that he had seen in the South. Um, so eventually they sort of, you know, grudgingly came to this sort of compromise it really to sort of study the problem. It was one of those, you know, things where just to sort of, um, and, um, and, you know, in the end, King, the, he, he sort of declared a victory based on this agreement to, to, to study the conditions, but he sort of left Chicago without really having accomplished that much. Um, and, uh, you know, for, again, for this young black power generation, 
which was watching all of this, and this is why I have two chapters on it in the book, they were looking at all of this and they were sort of saying, feeling vindicated. They were saying, you see, we were right about the limits of, 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 King's, of King's strategy. So I want to take, we got an interesting question in the chat. Um, it goes back to SNCC. Um, was, was internal conflict within SNCC centered on questions of principle and was that conflict fully self-created? Did you see evidence of FBI counterintelligence activities generating conflict in SNCC? Yes, so so all of the above, um, but there's a whole chapter just on that issue of, of, of the FBI. And um, the, uh, you know, there had not actually been, the FBI, it's well known that there had been a lot of surveillance uh, of Dr. King um, uh, before 1966. But uh, there had not been that much focus on SNCC until Stokely uh, became the chairman and started talking about black power. Then all of a sudden, uh, President Johnson starts asking these questions in phone calls and so forth, the records of, 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 of his phone calls, you know, who is this guy, Stokely Carmichael? What is black power, you know, and so forth. And he orders up um, uh, uh, his own personal weekly briefing on from the FBI on the activities of Stokely Carmichael. And all of a sudden the FBI, you know, um, uh, starts providing this uh, uh, for him. And you can track it. I went through the FBI files and so forth. And at first, for the first few weeks of this, you know, it's pretty innocuous stuff. It's just, you know, clippings from newspaper accounts of, of speeches he was giving. Um, but by the fall, they start digging up all this dirt on him, psychological evaluations that had been done for him when he had, when, um, uh, he had, he, uh, he had been evaluated for draft status. Um, uh, and, um, and anyway, so it's, 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 you know, there's definite evidence of, uh, of, of the FBI starting to, um, uh, not only gather information, but to sort of sow discontent within SNCC against Carmichael. Um, this later gets expanded starting 1967 to the Panthers. They do even more with the Panthers turning Huey Newton and Eldridge Cleaver against each other. Uh, turning the Panthers against this uh, uh, Karenga movement in, in LA that I that I talked about. So so all of that was very real. Uh, at the same time, um, there was also just you know real you know personality clashes, clashes about strategy, but also about um, execution within SNCC. And I talked about the the disputes between Stokely Carmichael and Ruby Doris Robinson, between John Lewis and the new leadership. Uh, uh, of SNCC. Um, so, so that played a role as well. Uh, so when, when you're talking about the infiltration in 67, I think you said, was that the COINTEL program or was, was that actually a little later where they- No, were... no, no, no. So that's the COINTEL program. Well, th that had existed, but, but, a, but a specific campaign aimed at black activist groups that was 1967. And uh, J. Edgar Hoover himself, you know, sometimes J. Edgar Hoover, you know, he was behind these things, but he didn't have his fingerprints on it. But in 1967, he sends his own personal directive to the field offices of the FBI, say, we have to do everything we can to prevent the emergence of a new black messiah, by which he right. meant a, a, a leader who could really sort of be seen as a leader of all black America um, in, a, in a way, you know, recognizing in a way that King was no longer that figure, particularly for, for, for young people. Um, and then after King's assassination in 68, the whole focus gets, you know, on becomes, you know, the black power leaders and particularly the Panthers. So for anybody who's seen the movie about Fred Hampton, the very charismatic Panther leader who was, who was essentially assassinated by the police, um, I think in, it was in 1969. 69. Uh, uh, um, the, the title of that film is Judas and the Black Messiah. The Messiah is a reference to Hoover's 
uh, that Hoover memo and the Judas was a, 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 an informant that the FBI had cultivated within the Panther uh, uh, chapter in, uh, in Chicago, which provided the police with um, essentially the blueprint to his apartment, which is how they were able to break in there in the middle of the night and, and shoot him dead in front of his pregnant, pregnant girlfriend. Um, so uh, I, I think we're going to end on this uh, very good question, um, which projects into the uh, future from 1966. How do you think the most effective means of bringing about change differ now from 1966? Well, you know, I, I thought a lot about this, and it's one reason I actually wrote the book is I sort of was looking for sort of what are the lessons today for for activism. I would say there was a couple. So, so one is just about messaging. Um, uh, you know, slogans like "Black Power" and today "Black Lives Matter" they're very powerful in capturing the spirit and sort of, you know, sort of becoming a kind of rallying point for for for, for movements for getting press attention and so forth. But you have to be able to really explain what you're trying to achieve. And one of the things I show in the book is that, you know, Stokely Carmichael in particular was, was sort of missed some, 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 some really, you know, important opportunities to do that when he, you know, was booked on shows like uh, Meet the Press and Face the Nation and so forth. So again, you think about today, you know, defund the police and so forth. You have to, because if you use this, you know, if you have these kinds of slogans, um, and, and you're not very clear in what you mean and what your actual policy objectives are, you know, your opponents are going to use them against you, right? So that's that's one lesson. I think unity, obviously, you know, there's always politics and infighting, you know, within these movements, but, you know, it, it does hurt. I mean, it, it, you know, it hurt the Black Power movement in the 60s and 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 to the degree that that's still true, it's, it's you know, it, it can hurt activism today. And then, and then the last thing is really about leadership, right? So, um, uh, the you know the, the the early SNCC organizers didn't think they needed a, a leader, you know, and and there were a lot of people who thought once John Lewis and then Stokely Carmichael started getting all this attention that that was unhealthy. Uh, today, I you know I've interviewed Alicia Garza, who was one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. She says we don't want a leader; everybody can be a leader. Um, well, I, my view is that if you look at the lessons of 66, but also of other, you know, uh, historic social uh, 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 activist movements and movements for, for, for political and, and social change around the world, what you see is that, you know, the really, what you really need is, is you need grassroots um, ground, you know, boots on the ground energy and, and, uh, enthusiasm. Um, but you also need, you know, smart, clear, strategic leadership and figures who not only people will follow, but will be recognized by your opponents, by the press, by, you know, as the people they can go to, to, um, you know, to, to, to have, to have uh, what you're trying to achieve ex explained. And to me, one of the great sort of tragic ironies of the year 1966 is, uh, you mentioned Malcolm X, who was assassinated in 1965, despite the fact that he, you know, had been he was had been dead for for a year. He looms over this entire year. All of these, uh, all of the people I write about in my book um, uh, looked up to him, thought they were carrying on the fight that he had begun. Um, but, you know, they were kids, you know, they were not as. And I think had he lived, he's the one person who, for a generation that was no longer willing to listen, take direction from Dr. King, they would have taken direction from him. When you look at how he had evolved in the last years of his life, I think he would have um, channeled their energy and their impatience and um, and this, this this new spirit of militancy, I think, in a, in a more constructive uh, in a more constructive direction. Um, well, well, we'll never know. We we won't know what would have happened yeah. if Martin Luther King had not been assassinated That's a couple years well, later yeah. in 1968. The book is called Saying It Loud, 
1966, the year Black Power challenged the civil rights movement. The author is my friend Mark Whitaker. Thanks to the National Archives, uh, and thanks to all of you for watching. I'm Jonathan Alter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John.